The scriptures say, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, for the Lord is the great God and the great King above all. Let us commit our time to him in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, our loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we would add our voices this night to the eternal host of heaven in praise of your holy name. We know that your glory is above the earth and heaven far above everything you have made. And we praise you so much that Christ has brought life and immortality through his triumph over sin and death and hell. And we thank you that we come this night to praise and worship a risen Saviour, your only Son who has done all things well. And we thank you that through his perfect life, his redemptive work upon the cross, and the vindication of that work in his stunning resurrection, that we are saved to the uttermost if we are those that call upon you, if we are those who have been granted true repentance and true faith. And Lord, as we come this night in these strange and difficult times, we pray that you would deal with us. We pray that you would instruct and edify us. We pray that the voice of our praise and prayer will come before you acceptably in the Lord Jesus Christ. We long to be those who worship you truly. And we ask that you'd have mercy upon us, both speaker and hearer alike. And we pray that we might be granted to see again the glory of the gospel. Lord, we long to gain some spiritual profit from your word. And we pray that if there are those watching who as of yet do not know Jesus Christ for themselves, we pray that they might be granted great grace and that they might be brought to see not only their sin, but all the loveliness and the wonder of the Saviour. We ask that there would be joy in heaven this night over repenting sinners. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us overrule in this time where there is lack. We confess our total need of your help. And may that note of praise come with humble gratitude from our hearts because of the greatness of salvation that you have given to us in your Son. And we ask these things only pleading him, pleading his shed blood, his merit, and pleading his name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
very warm welcome to everyone joining us for our services today on Sunday. Uh, praise God for bringing us together uh, over the internet to praise him and encourage one another. Uh, my name is Oliver Gross. I'm the pastor of Buckingham Chapel, but our preacher this weekend, being our anniversary weekend, is the Reverend Jonathan Stobbs, pastor of Penzance Baptist Church in Cornwall. We do thank Jonathan again for being willing to minister to us at this time. Yes, it's uh, our anniversary as a church, 173 years old uh, this weekend, and we give God thanks for his uh, faithfulness to us and his goodness, which continues. Our services today are 11 in the morning and 6 o'clock in the evening, as usual. Our midweek meeting this week is continuing our series in our church statement of faith, uh, our most holy faith. So please join us on Wednesday at half past seven. Uh, that will be a pre-recorded sermon this week on YouTube. And then there's a church officers meeting on Thursday at 7.20. Appreciate your prayers for us as we uh, come together to direct the affairs of the church, um, particularly looking towards Christmas, and how we can serve the Lord at this time. Uh, on that point, uh, an advance notice of our carol services. We're not quite sure what shape they will take at the moment, but uh, something, God willing, will happen uh, on the 13th of December, Sunday 13th in the morning, and the following week, Sunday the 20th of December in the evening, we will have carol themed services. Whether that will be at the chapel uh, or pre-recorded online remains to be seen. We will let you know in good time. Next Sunday, our services are again at 11 in the morning and 6 in the evening. The preacher in the morning will be myself and in the evening, our elder John Norris. Please pray for us. And also, if in any way we can help you, uh, please do get in touch. Uh, John's details and mine are on the website. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And if we can help in any way, spiritually or practically, please don't hesitate to contact us. As we come to the end of this anniversary weekend, it is once again my privilege to have been able to have taken these meetings, even in very unusual circumstances. And please be assured of our ongoing prayers for you as a fellowship there in Bristol, and uh, we'll be remembering you here in Penzance. And pray that the Lord will bless you richly in the days ahead and enable you to stand firm and proclaim a faithful gospel that many might be pointed to the Saviour. Well, tonight I'd like you to turn in God's Word to Hebrews chapter 2. And over the weekend, we've looked at the power of the kingdom, the preeminence of the king. And then tonight, we're looking at the proclamation of the church. So, Hebrews 2, and we'll begin reading at verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receive a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will? For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels but one testified in a certain place saying what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him you have made him a little lower than the angels you have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands you have put all things in subjection under his feet for in that he put all in subjection under him he left nothing that is not put under him but now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, 
for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly I will sing praise to you, and again I will put my trust in him, and again here am I in the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Amen. And we pray the Lord would help us as we come to his precious word this night. Almighty God and our loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wonder of your word. We thank you that you have granted that in it we should have the revelation of who you are and who your Son is and what the Gospel is and what salvation is, what sin is, what righteousness is, what it means to be saved, to be born again, to be called a child of God. And we thank you that the Holy Spirit works upon the word to bring this truth to sight to open blind eyes and unstop deaf ears, to hear that joyful sound that Jesus saves. And we bless you, O God, for this good news of salvation, all of its great truths and its promises and its pleadings. And Lord, we know and by its truth we understand that we were hopelessly lost, that we were far off, and yet you sought and found us, that we were poor and empty, 
and yet you have made us rich beyond measure in Christ. That we were in darkness and yet you have brought us into that most marvellous light. That we are in bondage to sin and yet you have set us at liberty and made us slaves to righteousness. That you have become for us a place of refuge, our fortress, our rock, our redeemer. And Lord, we would ask once again this night as we seek to worship you, that you would help us to delight in Christ, that we would know him, that we would acknowledge him as our glorious and only saviour. And we thank you that if we are in Christ, that we do not come as those who have no hope, who will be of all men most miserable. But we thank you that we come with a hope that is certain and true, because the Lord Jesus Christ has broken the bands of death. We thank you that love's redeeming work has been done, that the fight has been fought, that the battle has been won, and that Christ has birthed the gates of hell. Oh Lord, we do thank you that it is through him and him alone that we have that way by which we can know you, that we have that certain hope, a prospect of glory to come. And we thank you so much that for the believer, death has lost its sting. And the day approaches when we shall be with him where he is, for we shall be made like him. And because he lives, we shall live also. What a precious saviour. And Lord, we thank you so much for that divine and sovereign grace which has transformed us and how we have been delivered from the curse and placed under your blessing through Christ. Lord, we worship you. We desire, O oh God, to live to your glory and be pleased, Lord, as we come with gratitude and worship. Lord, we ask that you might draw us out to yourself this night, that we might know your nearness in these strange and complicated times. Lord, in the midst of all that is taking place, we realise still that the most important thing is to be reconciled to you. And we pray that there may yet be still those who are considering the eternal state. We pray that there might be those who are confronted with the truth of the gospel. And Lord, we do pray again for the church uh, at Bristol, Buckingham Chapel. And oh God, how we pray that again you would do that mighty work which only you can do. We do pray for each and every one involved in that work that you would sustain and bless. Lord, you know the state of each one. You know those who may be struggling in the way. Lord, please refresh them and strengthen them. Lord, for those who are maybe feeling downcast and sad, we pray that you comfort their hearts. For those going through trials and difficulties, we pray, Lord, that you would give them to know that your promises are sure and that your mercies are new every morning. For those, Lord, who are keen and zealous to serve you, we pray that you would continue with them and open up those doors of service for them. We pray, O oh God, that you would make them a bright light on the hill, as it were, that you would make them that glorious witness for you in the midst of that city. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would do a mighty work. Thank you again for those who lead. Please bless them, especially for the pastor that you would refresh and strengthen Lord, for those who come alongside him in leadership, use them. For everyone involved in your work, just commend all into your care. And Lord, we do pray for your people around this world. We think especially of those who are facing great difficulty and persecuted for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please be near to them and appear for them. And Lord, grant them to know that you are with them and you will never leave them or forsake them. Confound their enemies, we pray. And Lord, we ask that the gospel cause would advance and that even enemies would be confounded and all to your praise, honour and glory. So hear us then, we pray, as we cry out to you now, pleading again only our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Well, Hebrews 2 is in view this evening, proclamation of the church, and really it's bound up in this vital question that we find in Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now, the author of this letter is exhorting Hebrew Christians and he is exhorting them to be taken up with the gospel and with Jesus Christ. Because when we lose sight of the glory and the stunning wonder of the gospel, we are in a very dangerous position. And he says this in verse 1 of the passage. He says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And so the people to whom he is writing under the inspiration of the Spirit, you know, they were, they were tending to forget, to neglect the things that they had heard taking them for granted, to the extent that some of them are even looking back longingly to their old Jewish religion and the acceptance that that would bring. So he has to call them back to the message of the gospel and exhort them to give them more earnest heed to it and to be very careful not to drift off away from this glorious message and the centrality of the cross. And you say, well, why do we need to hear these things? And I would say that there are many Christians who need this same exhortation right now in this day and age in which we live. And also, you know, maybe there are those who are watching tonight who think that they are believers, but they're not truly converted. And so I want you to see this great saving message once again, all of its truths. And, you know, we ask the question, don't we, why do we carry on with the church of Jesus Christ? Why should it continue? You know, there are many who point at local churches like the ones in which we serve and they say, oh, you're irrelevant, you're outdated, you can't really impact the society around you, you know, the community you're in, you can't impact them, they don't know what you're talking about. Some insist that we might as well keep the, the door shut because there isn't anything about us that offers anything to this world. You know, and it's, it's embarrassing, surely, that we should cause people to consider such an old-fashioned message. Why bother going on? And so it's important for us to remind ourselves of the reasons why we press on preaching the gospel, why we must undertake this proclamation, why we must maintain that public witness to Jesus Christ, this task that he has given to us as his church. That we go on proclaiming this message and we invite and call people to hear it, that the world should hear. Why? Because we are proclaiming so great a salvation. That's what we're about. That's why we should hold on to it. And it's why everybody else should listen. But is it really worth listening to? Is the writer to the Hebrews correct? to speak about the gospel in the way that he does, as a great salvation. I want you to see firstly that this gospel is a unique message of salvation, a message of deliverance, of healing, of liberty, of power. That's the character of the message we've been given to proclaim. And the writer under the Holy Spirit, he, he doesn't just speak of the gospel or salvation. He speaks of the greatness of it. And he does it because these foolish Hebrew Christians have been so quick to forget that this is something great and marvellous. They, they've taken it for granted. They've begun to see it as something small. And the way that he speaks isn't unique to him. It's throughout the scriptures. You know, if you're familiar with your Bible, particularly the New Testament, you'll see that the gospel is always described in these grand spectacular terms we're always faced with the majesty and the greatness and the immensity of this salvation of God that God has provided think of Ephesians 2 Paul is struggling to find language to express it he speaks of grace but then he goes on to speak about the exceeding riches of God's grace and his kindness toward us in Ephesians 3, he speaks of the unsearchable riches of Christ, the love of Christ which passes knowledge, and so on. And we find that language throughout the New Testament. You can't read it with open eyes spiritually without being struck with 
the fact that this salvation is magnificent really is stunning. And you know, that attitude has always been characteristic of the Lord's people. It comes across in the way that they preach and write and, you know, think of the many great hymns and how they're full of such richness. They draw out the, the big truth so well. You know, I think of Isaac Watts, you know, when he looks at the cross of Jesus, when he surveys it, what does he say? What is he moved to pen? When I survey the wondrous cross, you know, it just doesn't take a momentary glance at Calvary. It's too incredible for that. You know, or even Bernard Heim, great is the gospel of our glorious God. You know, we could bring out many, many, many more examples. And you could consider the way that this great salvation has inspired and moved believers and done so in many different spheres to preach with such profound insight and eloquence and oratory from men it seemed beyond, you know, touch so many aspects of life. And what was it that moved them? What gripped them? What fired them? It was the glory and the greatness of this gospel. And so let me ask you tonight, how do you view it? How do you view this gospel? You know, if you're a believer, do you actually dwell on the fact that your salvation is the most incredible thing to ever happen to you? Do those around you, those who know you, get the impression that you have found the most wonderful thing in the world? You know, I've found the pearl of greatest price. My heart will sing for joy. How often we give this idea, you know, that the things are so bad and we're in these difficult days and the gospel is now something small and, and narrow and confined. You know, or do we give the impression to the world that they're missing out on the most incredible, the most glorious thing in the entire stratosphere. That's what the writer to the Hebrews is claiming for the gospel. And it challenged the Hebrew believers, it challenges us, have we lost sight of the greatness? Do we have such a, a, a small view of the gospel? Have we lost confidence that it is the power of God unto salvation. Are we tempted to think that actually we need other things to, to supplement it, to, to help it out? We need to come back to this. And so why is this salvation great? Well, it's great because of its author. Look at verses three to four. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So do you see there in that text, we have the Lord Jesus Christ, first spoken by the Lord and confirmed by those who heard him. You also have in that text, the Father, God also bearing witness. And then you have the Holy Spirit, the signs and wonders, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. So when someone says, well, why is this salvation so great? Well, it's great because it's of God and it is brought about by the Holy Trinity. Each person of the Godhead is involved in this. It's a staggering reality. And friends, when you're thinking about why we should ask the world to hear this message, that's your answer. You know, we've listened to philosophers, we've listened to celebrities, we've listened a lot to politicians and Yet the world continues in a spiral of depravity. And so what are we saying? What is our challenge to the world? Well, we're saying this, come and listen to what God says. Come and listen to the word of God, not the word of men. Come and listen to the word of God. And the writer to the Hebrews is so full of how great this salvation is. He doesn't even begin the letter with the usual greetings. He just burst straight into what is on his heart. Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 2, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son. This is God speaking, the greatest thing that we can hear. And here we have the explanation of why the world is as it is. 
the trouble that faces each and every one of us, how God sees this, but also the remedy that he has provided. Salvation is so great because it's of the Lord and Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They cooperate together to produce this outstanding, sure deliverance. That's why it's great. But it's great not only because of its author, but because of what it rescues us from. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You know, we can't really appreciate the greatness of this salvation until we understand the greatness of the trouble and predicament that it saves us from. You know, we live in a world that's full of trouble and conflict. And even though the terrible things that are happening in this world are very serious and very grave, you know, in comparison with the calamity that the soul faces, if it rejects the gospel, you know, they fade. How will we escape? The thing we are looking to escape from, it is, it is terrible, it is terrifying, it's awful. We only understand the value of a cure when we consider the significance and danger of the disease. Seen that with the, the rush for the vaccines. And our text is dealing with something infinitely more significant than bodily cures. It's dealing with the eternal, the spiritual. How will we escape if we neglect so great salvation? He makes the point powerful. Look at verse two. If the word spoken through angels who have steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received the just reward. The writer is saying there that the law of God has outlined the calamity, defined it for us, diagnosed what our problem is. And he talks about transgression. He talks about disobedience of the law. He talks about the punishment that God has announced will come upon such. You think of those sobering texts, Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul who sins shall die. Or Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. You know, the law has pronounced this. This is the, the great message of the Old Testament, the full extent being made clear in the New Testament. Or Galatians 3, 24, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. Galatians 3.19, the law was added because of transgressions. So that as Romans 7.3 says, sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. And so the law of God, it exposes, it describes sin. It describes the punishment that sin deserves. And the writer to the Hebrews says that the gospel shows that even more clearly. But you know, even if you approach it from the level of the law, this message is still needed by the world in which we live. You know, why is the world so disinterested in the gospel? It's because people have no idea about their condition, their predicament, their plight without the gospel. You know, they carry on day-to-day -day lives and as long as they can get through and got some money to spend and things to pursue and family, all those things will find. You know, many of us have been praying that this pandemic would cause people to consider the mortality, to consider the bigger questions of life. And maybe a few have, and we pray that that is the case, but the majority just seem to be waiting for it to be over, to get back to the way they were. They don't want to think of death. They don't want to countenance a judgment. So they have no ideas see no need for the gospel no need for a savior they got no idea of the terror and the awfulness of the last judgment the eternity of misery outside the life of god but the bible is clear it tells us that this is the destiny of men and women who die in sin without believing in the lord jesus christ the law has established this the lord has repeated it he declared the Lord Jesus declared his whole purpose was to come to seek and save that which was lost. He and he alone can do it. You know, there is none other, nothing else that can save. You know, the law itself seemed to be enough, but now Christ has come. He's the only way of salvation. And so to neglect it, to ignore it, it's a terrifying prospect. 
And so this salvation is great because it's God's salvation. He has prescribed it, but also because of what it saves us from, an eternity of misery and punishment and wretchedness, it saves us from that. But it's also great because of what it brings us to and saves us for. You know, in the positive, this salvation is so great because of what it brings the sinner to. And that's what the writer emphasises in the rest of chapter 2. So many wonderful realities of what it means to be a true believer saved by this glorious gospel. You know, later on in verse 17, it speaks of forgiveness of sins. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Friends, there is nothing as valuable as this, to know that Christ has dealt with your sin, that he's paid for it at Calvary, that he's reconciled you to God, to know that your sin is dealt with, forgiven, past, present, future. They've been washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Do you know, as a pastor over these years, at times you meet with people who are struggling with guilt and can't find peace. Sometimes so much so that the guilt and knowledge of sin, it affects them physically and in all manner of ways. And those who struggle to sleep because they can't find peace of mind and certain things they've done in the past haunt them and, and plague them in the present. What, what do you do? It was only one thing to point such a one towards a, word, a way by which they can know that their sin can be forgiven and dealt with. To point them to the Son of God who came from heaven to earth to deal with those realities. You know, there's such liberating power in that marvellous declaration, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. To come to Christ in repentance and faith and to know that all your sin has been dealt with, it has been forgiven, it has been blotted out, cast as it were into the depths of the sea. And to know that you are at peace with God. To know that peace that, that floods the soul, nothing compares with that. You know, you, you can't buy peace or, or happiness. People try, but you can't. You can't buy peace of mind and peace of conscience. Money can't remove the, the fear of death. There's only one way that that can happen. It's through so great salvation. Forgiveness of sin. But also this salvation is great because it makes us children of God. We're not merely introduced to God and given an opportunity to speak with him. But God embraces us in Christ. He adopts us into his family. Look at the beauty of verses 10 to 13. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly I will sing praise to you and again I will put my trust in him and again here am I and the children whom God has given me. I wonder if you've ever really thought over some of those verses and the depth particularly of the phrase in verse 11 where it says for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. Now what does that mean? Who is he who sanctifies? Well that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are those who are being sanctified? Well, it's those of us who are true believers. And we are all of one, but what is the writer speaking of? Well, he's speaking of one nature. We've been born again and born of the Spirit. As Peter says, we've been made partakers of the divine nature. And that's why it goes on to say, for which reason he, Christ, is not ashamed to call them brethren. You know, that's why the author of this letter calls it such a, a, a great salvation because the Christian isn't just pardoned and, and forgiven but adopted into the royal family of heaven. You're a child of God. You belong to the heavenly family. 
You know, I've been privileged in the past to meet men and women of significance, even royalty. But, you know, I was still the same person after a northerner, still a, a commoner. They didn't take me into the family, didn't take me home with them. I wasn't adopted in that way. But you see, the gospel is different. The gospel offers us through free grace that you will become a child of God. That you become someone of whom it can be said, whom the King of kings and Lord of lords is not ashamed to be called your brother. And that's just staggering. The privileged position into which the believer is placed. We are made children of God. But then also we're given power to overcome sin. You know, the believer is made a child of God, but whilst in this world still has to fight the world, the flesh and the devil, and temptations are powerful and strong, and how are we going to face them and deal with them? Well, this great salvation gives us the answer. Verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. See, the Lord Jesus Christ has not only dealt with the problem of the guilt of sin, he also deals with the problem of the power of sin. Think of that amazing hymn by Top Lady, Rock of Ages. This is how he puts it, cleanse me from its guilt and power. That's what the Lord does. That's part of this great salvation. He's with us. He's promised that he won't leave us, that he'll guide us, that he'll go through all the trials and troubles and heartaches that we face all the way through our earthly pilgrimage. He gives us that enabling power and he gives us security in our citizenship of heaven verses 5 through 8 for he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels but one testified in a certain place saying what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him you have made him a little lower than the angels you have crowned him with glory and honour and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. You know, those words are glorious. And it's speaking of this great salvation in terms of the world to come. You know, this year has impressed upon us that we are living in an uncertain world. Look at the terrible events that are taking place and you look around and you see now beyond the pandemic, the explosion of conflict and even in the, the, the sense of nature, you know, we look and we think, how long is this world going to last? Nobody knows. It's an insecure and uncertain world and we know that. But in the midst of it all, the child of God is secure. And they belong to a world to come which is totally secure and certain for all eternity our citizenship is in heaven hebrews 13 14 here we have no continuing city but we seek the one to come and just like abraham we like him in hebrews 11 10 waited for the city which is foundations whose builder and maker is god this city which is utterly secure eternal foundation and friends, I hope you know it's not being prepared for angels. It's being prepared for us. Romans 8, 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? By grace, we are given this glorious, secure future. And it's all of the Lord's mercy and love. It's a, it's a stunning salvation. Yes, we are saved from hell, but we are saved to this everlasting and eternal glory that we shall enjoy with Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And as one has said, all the spirits of just men made perfect and angels and archangels and cherubim and all the heavenly hosts forever and ever. Does that thrill your heart? This salvation is great because of what it saves us for. And this salvation is great because of how it was accomplished. And this is the greatest point of all. 
brings us back to what we were considering this morning, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. You know, we all enjoy watching things, don't we, with good storylines and, you know, sacrifice and commitment and, you know, we want to see a, a drama of a, a gripping story, but, you know, the very best that man can come up with fades and pales in insignificance when you compare it to the narrative of redemptive history. You know, this real and glorious narrative of God intervening to save sinners, it's all laid out before us here in Hebrews 2. You know, look at verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Now, who is Jesus? Verse 3, he is the Lord. Jesus of Nazareth, yes. Jesus the, the carpenter, yes. But beyond that, he is the Lord of glory. And just as the author of the Hebrews burst into chapter 1, he cannot understand how these Hebrew Christians could be losing their way. They've obviously lost sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, what did we mention from that text in Hebrews 1? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, yes, they were great men, and the Lord spoke through them. And the writer is in no way detracting from the role that God gave them at that time. But you put them next to this one, the preeminent one, and they fade. Because God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, this is who Jesus is, what he was from all eternity, the express image of God, maker and sustainer. He created everything, even angels. And the rest of chapter 1 goes on to tell us about the comparison between the Son and the angels. And we're told that this glorious person was made a little lower than the angels. That should move us. You think of Paul writing in Philippians 2, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. The Lord of glory born as a helpless babe, his glory veiled as it were. He didn't lose anything when he humbled himself in this way. Rather, he divested himself of the external manifestations to take human nature. As it says in verse 16, indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. And he stretched out a helping hand to the seed of Abraham, taking upon himself human nature. And he was fully God and yet fully man. And he humbled himself and he made himself a servant. And what a remarkable thing it is. And also God cannot tempt and he himself cannot be tempted. But we're told in verse 18 that he himself, Christ himself, suffered being tempted. Or in Hebrews 4, when it says, was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, the Holy Son of God, the one who had eternally been with the Father and the Holy Spirit in holiness, in purity, to whom sin is utterly abhorrent, humbled himself to be tempted like you and me. And why did he do it? Verse 9, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He came down from the throne to the cross, the life giver who gave himself to death. Nothing compares with these things. From the very height of glory to come into this broken world of sin. And not just that, but then to give himself to death and even the death of the cross. 
and to die upon the cross and they they took his body and laid it in a tomb and the sustainer of the universe buried in a grave thank god it wasn't the end origin in heaven accomplishment on earth down to the grave what then we see jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honour and he burst the bands of death and he arose and as 2 Timothy 1.10 says brought life and immortality to light through the gospel and he ascended and he took his seat at the right hand of God again we think of Hebrews 1 when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high and there he is now and he lives and he reigns and all history is in his hand and the day approaches when he shall come again and he shall ride the very clouds of heaven surrounded by all the holy angels to judge the world and in all the majesty of his eternal glory and his glorious deity he will come and every eye will see him and those who believe in him will rise to be with him and will share in his glory and will enjoy his presence in the indescribable blessings of the eternal kingdom forever. Friends, he did this for us. This is a great salvation. Is anything else worth our consideration, devotion and worship like this? Do we apologise about being a Christian? Do we grudgingly drag our feet to hear these things? Are we given the impression that the gospel is something small and insignificant and narrow? You know, if that's so, it's either because we've never seen it or we've lost sight of this so great salvation. And I pray that we would be granted that I salve that the Lord spoke of to the church of Laodicea and pray that the Holy Spirit would enlighten the eyes of our understanding that we may see again the, the wonder of it all and especially the Saviour himself the Lord of glory who did all this oh have you seen it the greatness and the glory of it all pray that you give yourself no rest until you find yourself lost in wonder, love and praise. And especially as you gaze on Christ with the eyes of faith and fall at his feet. And long for that day when we will be in his immediate presence and glory forever. That is what we are to proclaim. This great gospel. God's gospel. A gospel which saves from hell delivers us to glory and all bound up in our wonderful Saviour, Jesus Christ. All praise to his name. Amen.
Yahweh, the God who is mighty, the Lamb who is worthy, and the Spirit who is near, fortify you to live faithfully in these days and all the days until Jesus comes. Amen.